Previously on the Adventure Zone, that it seems like the undead, or I should say the living dead, are immune to the Void Fish's powers. This apparition, uh, this red robed lich, it starts to lose its composure. It starts to lose, and I mean that literally, like the, the spectral form starts to jerk violently and a bolt of energy uh, kind of like whips off of it. Taco, your Umbra staff turns inside out and sucks that wand in and devours it. Mm -hmm. You remember the Umbra Staff is capable of, of consuming the magic essence of your defeated foes. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys are going to get out of here, so I'm going to part ways with you now. What? Um, when you see Lucretia again, tell her, I don't know, make up something heroic for me, I guess. Nope. You jump back up in, onto the catwalk, and as you do, you hear fake Magnus go, <gasps> What? Wearing a plate of very, very, very fashionable elven scale mail, you see one of the mannequins standing right next to you. <laughs> I'll be having my body back, you undead fuck. Aw, oh, dead. What a cool cuss. I think you might be doing some cussing of your own by this episode's end. It's the Adventure Zone! Let's roll initiative. That's always a really exciting way to start a podcast is the sound of dice hitting some table. I wish and then I also the, And also the math. Like, people love it when it's just like, welcome to the story. Now it's just math time. I wish I had wooden <laughs> dice. That'd be very fitting. Nine. Oh, my God. Oh, I have advantage, don't I, on initiative? I have yes. That was one. That was a, my fifth one. And a two. Hey, awesome. Nice. Much better. What'd you get, Taco? Nine. Uh, okay. So before uh, before we get into the fight, something happens. That that black smog that's uh, all uh, like surrounding the ceiling of this gigantic cavernous room that you are all uh, uh, all in, standing on this catwalk in the middle of it, um, it starts to take shape immediately above the three of you, and it forms into a massive steel beam. Um, that just after it takes shape, it uh, becomes sort of uh, uh, affected by gravity, and it starts to fall towards you. Um, and just before you sort of reflexively prepare to leap out of the way with varying levels of success, uh, I'm sure, you, you hear a crash. And you look up, and you see two human-shaped statues have also formed out of the smog, and their arms are held up over their heads. And they've caught this big, heavy beam that was about to fall on you. Um, and all of you can see the red robe now, not just Magnus, um, because Magnus, you don't have true sight anymore because you don't have your body anymore. Uh, but all of you can see now, plain as day, the red robe. Um, and its uh, hand is outstretched in the direction of these uh, statues. Uh, and all of it, the statues and the beam, uh, revert back into black smog that uh, lifts up into the ceiling. Uh, uh Listen, uh, Taco, Merle, I know that's a little weird, and you're just going to have to trust me on this one. He's with us, I think, more or less. Uh, he he gives you a big thumbs up. with. Uh, I give him uh, a wooden, like, uh, salute. Uh, Taco, and, Taco and Merle, are you guys cool with that? Yeah, I've watched TV before. I know how these <laughs> things go. <laughs> um, all right. Seeing this new entrant into the fight and seeing that this uh, this trap made out of smog didn't land... Uh, Magnus, or fake Magnus, in uh, Edward inside of Magnus laughs, and he says, uh, well, this fight just got a lot more interesting. And then he reaches a burly arm up into the air and snaps. And suddenly the cylindrical chambers that are surrounding this central platform, they all start emitting these different colored beams of neon light that shoot up and onto the ceiling of this massive chamber. And uh, that outer ring of cylinders begins to rotate around the central platform, um, the floor of which has also turned into a checkered neon light. Uh, first in the order is Lydia, who is, uh, she is floating up into the air. Um, and I think on her first turn, she 
uh, casts a spell, and she heals Magnus. Oh, that's the, oh. She what? heals Magnus for thirty-eight points of damage. Super cool. Wait a Not minute! Me, I thought healing didn't work in here. Uh, she says, uh, "Oh, that's only a one-way street, dear." Um, wow. Next in the order is um, real Magnus, or, or yeah, real Magnus, mannequin Magnus. Now, man- Ma- Travis, do you want to tell everybody what I made for you? I made you a little present. Griffin made me a mannequin sheath. I would like to read a little bit of it, just the right side column. Personality traits is a mannequin. Ideals to be a mannequin. Bonds very few because is mannequin. Flaws splinters. <laughs> and then under features and traits is a literal mannequin. <laughs> Super great. Fears termites. You'll notice, you'll notice under languages you can speak common and mannequin. So we'll uh, see then I that. turn to all the mannequins around the table and I say hello. Um, yeah, I guess there's a bunch of uh, I, I guess there's a bunch of mannequins in the audience, and when you talk to them, they all start clapping and applauding and and cheering for you. Any help? They should all shake their heads now and shrug. Super cool. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. You know what? I'm gonna jump onto Magnus. Okay. Uh, let's. What are you trying to do? What's your What's your goal here? I'm trying to get the chance lance away. Okay, so I think you're going to have to overpower him. Uh, I think it's going to take two checks. I think you're going to have to overpower him first. It's going to be and, hard. I'm very strong. Uh, yes, you are. Uh, you're going to have to overpower him first, and then I think maybe slide a hand to try to like get the actually Damn get the it. thing out of his hand. Yeah. Okay. Is there any chance that Magnus's body is having any sort of allergic reaction to healing magic? We we wouldn't know before this <laughs> point. So. I... Uh, what did you get on your strength check? I'm trying to think if there's anything I know about my own body that would help me here. <laughs> Do you have a, a fucking a weak point? That's yeah, like I've never me. said it before, but like I have a blind my spot. One thing about me is my soft spot never closed over. <laughs> I hope no one ever finds out. I've got that trick knee. My okay. adult, my adult fontanelle. I rolled a fifteen <laughs> plus three, eighteen. Okay, well, I rolled a, a, a 14, yeah. but it's going to be higher because... It's like plus nine or some shit. Yeah, he's a strong boy. So you jump onto uh, real Magnus. Uh, you, you, you jump onto... I'm just, I'm just going to use names and not like refer to body, That's gonna, or else this fight's going to be garbage. But uh, you try to jump onto Edward inside of your body, but he very easily shrugs you off. And uh, I think you kind of... Make a deck save for me. Uh, nine plus. Okay, you keep you three, keep your 12. you keep your footing um, as he brushes you off. You you aren't like thrown thrown to the ground. Next in the order is Edward, and he draws Rail Splitter, and he says, uh, "Let's see what this baby can do." Uh, and he does a goading attack to you, Magnus. Uh, <laughs> that is a twenty-one versus AC. I mean, I know that that's hits. A hit. Yeah. Um, so, I will say, Griffin, I'm I'm confused here because I don't see him as the mannequin to have any advantages whatsoever. No, it's almost like you're a mannequin. I don't know <laughs> what I'm supposed to do with this body to make this fight not one sided. Um, work with your work with your friends. Um, so I had a superior a superiority die to the damage roll, so that's uh, sixteen damage, and you have to make a wisdom saving throw. Oh, that's got to be good, right? Seventeen plus. Yeah, that does it. Okay, you are yeah, not yeah. you are not goaded. Um, for my second there, attack, there should be. I'm going to make uh, just a, an argument here, Griffin, that because my body is made of wood, mm. I should take decreased damage. No, I don't think so. You would you would think that being wood, I would take less damage than a flesh body hit by an axe. Yeah, Merle, he's going to come after you with rail splitter. This is bullshit. Uh, uh, and he got a uh, 18 versus AC? Yeah. Okay. And he I just want to remind all of our listeners, if you're sitting and going, but Rail Splitter against wood, that's only against trees. This, it has very yes, specific yes, yes. magic. Yes, yes. Uh, that's only nine damage. I'm dead. Whoa, really? Yep. Well, we've had a lot of fun here with... No, that's not how death works, but you are unconscious. Okay. 
Uh, Merle drops to the ground as uh, uh, Taka, this is probably pretty upsetting for you and you, Matt. I've just been killed. Is yeah, nobody going to be upset? You're not killed. You're unconscious, you baby. Uh, uh, you just saw, you just saw uh, like Magnus, and it's not really Magnus, but like you saw your friend who you've been traveling with for a year just cut down your other friend. Um, I, I imagine it's pretty brutal, but yeah, Merle, you are down on the ground. Next in the order is Taco. I am going to cast. Now I've got. I've reached a point where when I hear Justin say I'm going to cast, I assume the next words are like a thing that's going to break the sequence of the shit that you've written down. <laughs> um, no, I'm not going to. No, it's not going to happen. Um, I'm going to cast animate objects on. The, oh. um Okay. Uh, I'm going to ca- an- cast animate objects on the the mannequins, and I can animate up to ten of them. Holy fucking shit! What? Jesus, yeah, I- Fantasia. Jesus yeah, Fantasia Barino. I'm going to animate dun, dun, dun. all of them uh, and command them to just like tackle Magnus. Okay. Flesh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so, so they have, let me tell you, this, let me, let me do this first. Fair, let me do this first. Cause the fair play. They are also right now under the control of probably Lydia since she's like in 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 lich form still. I I will let you attempt this, but I think this is like I think this is a fucking like contest of wills, right? So I think Can I give just... Taco advantage by speaking to my wooden brethren. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, what do you say, friends, mannequins? Lend me your ears. Lem, help us, my wooden brothers. Join me in this fight against your captors, your controllers. They have used you for evil, and we shall use you. We shall free you from their bonds. And after this, we'll totally take you with us, 100% guaranteed. Uh, okay, they're, they're into it. Let's do a straight up and down int contest. Okay, cool. Um, I got a five. I got an 18. <laughs> okay. Suck it. Ten of these mannequins are now under your control, and they kind of like shake their heads and they climb up onto the stage. And you're just having them just tackle, tackle Magnus yeah. outright. They have or Edward outright. They have um, forty hit points, wow. thirteen AC, plus five to hit, two D six plus one damage. Strength is ten, Dex is twelve. So wait, you can actually? They're, they're all wait. They're all attacking. <gasps> What's up? So this horde of okay. Go, my beautiful army. I should clarify, actually, upon further reading of the spell, if they're medium, I can only do five. So there's five. Okay. Um, okay. So they fi- I'm going to do five attacks then? Five attacks against Edward. That's right. Uh, uh, why don't you roll them? Just roll, roll 5d20, and we'll do okay. an average for damage and add it up like that so we get through it fast. Fucking 18, shit. 18, 11, 15... Five, eleven plus plus five to hit. Oh well, then I think three of those hit. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, and what's the damage? Two d six plus one. I just roll two d six and we'll five, four. Okay, so ten. So fucking thirty points of damage. Yeah, it sounds about right. Okay, so five of these mannequins climb up out of the audience and just start bludgeoning. Uh, Magnus, and uh, he uses Rail Splitter to fight off two of them, but three of them get the better of him. Um, and that was a pretty good, that was a pretty fucking good turn of events that just happened. Um, Merle, you're up next. Roll a d20 for me, because it's time for a death save. Have we ever done a death save in the two and a half years we've been making this show? I no. do not I don't think, think we so. have. Okay, you we just got rolled. knocked in, in Pedal Ta- to the Metal. Taco got, got knocked, knocked out. Knocked out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got knocked out, but I um, think we got rescued, right? I think so, before this had to happen. So roll a d20. We got police. What we need, <laughs> there has to be a competent woman somewhere. That's what we always lean on. <laughs> we are in dire straits as a competent woman. Where's an uh, adult? Roll a, roll a d20, uh, Merlin. You don't add anything to it. You want to roll good. 15. All right. That's one success. Uh, if you get to three successes, you're stable at zero hit points. If you reach three failures, you are dead forever. Merle's gone. Now, what can we do to impact you can, that scenario? You can heal him, but uh-oh. Um, the other thing you can do is make a medicine 
check. Um, and with a roll of 10 in medicine, you stabilize him like he has had three successes, but it takes your action up. Okay. Am I allowed to know what the number is I got to beat? 10. Uh, it's 10. Straight okay. up and down 10. If you roll a 20, it counts. If, it count, if you roll a crit 20, you pop back up to one I HP. Am, I am as dead as dead can be. <laughs> um, on her next turn, it's Lydia's turn. Um, actually, something happens before her turn. A, a big iron wrecking ball swings out of the black smog, manifesting from the smog, and it starts to swing in your direction, Taco. And at the last second, another one, another wrecking ball forms out of the out of the smog, uh, swinging in at a perpendicular angle, and it smashes into the other one, and it sort of sends them both sailing off course, like splitting the uprights around you. Uh, and as they both sort of pass you, missing by uh, a few inches, they turn back into smog. Cool, 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 cool. So Lydia's up next. She is going to cast on uh, Mannequin Magnus, uh, Ray of Enfeeblement. Uh Uh-huh. And then? Uh, Black Beam of Innervating Energy extends from your finger. Uh, Make a spell ranged attack roll against a target. On hit, the uh, target only deals half damage with weapon attacks that use strength until the spell ends. When the spell ends? Uh, You make a constitution save. Uh, That's an 18 versus AC. Yeah, that hits. All right, so H- you do half you, damage on an attack. A half damage uh, save save ends. Got it. Uh, you are up, Magnus. Okay. I, you know, I've never thought about this before. Where does my body keep its items? All over. But as you just saw, it's going to be tough for you to get a weapon from your body. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, I I want to run up and kind of like throw my arms around myself. Okay. And in doing so, I want to attempt to activate my magnetic charge. What does that do? Magnetic charge, I've never used it before. Okay. For a very specific reason that I will describe now. It flings away mental objects from the owner of magnetic charge up to 10 feet. Metal (laughs) objects like rail splitter or the chance lance or the shield. Uh, A fist-sized glass ball with a blue button on top. Once the button is pressed, the ball will begin to glow and produce a magnetic field. The field repels any metal object within 10 feet from the ball. Take (laughs) one day for enough charge to build up to use again. All right, cool. Um, Yeah, so I think here's what I'll do for this, because I like it a lot. Um, Instead of making you overpower him first, I think this is just a sleight of hand, like almost like you're pickpocketing him. Um, and that's an 18, motherfucker. Yeah, do you have any, any bonus? <laughs> Plus that? dex, that's three, that's 21. Yeah, that's definitely success. Okay, this is fucking cool. This is only a one time use dealie, though, right? So, Correct. I guess it's all been, uh, yeah, this is, this is, I can't not let this and, happen. It's once per day, good. but yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, you, uh, managed to sort of, uh, get, get within range and dodge. I, I think he's at this point fighting off the other mannequins that Taco is sicked on him. Uh, and you sort of get around behind your body and see this uh this clipped into your belt and you manage to get your mannequin hand on the object and click down on that blue button uh and sure enough um i think uh i i think this his his armor wouldn't go flying off it's probably tied and secured onto him um also if memory serves it's that cool raven yeah, armor that feather leather shit. yeah um but uh, yeah, the shield of heroic memories goes flying uh, off the catwalk, and in- I think all this stuff uh, goes flying off the catwalk and into the crowd. Um, so the shield goes flying off, rail splitter goes flying off, the chance lance uh, goes flying off, and actually hits one of the mannequins in the crowd, uh, which collapses. Merle, your eyeglasses go flying off. Woo! Um, it's only a sphere of ten feet, so yeah, the, the, and, yeah, and they are on the they're on the cusp of it, so it's not as dramatic an effect. It kind of, you can see where they landed because they're not corrective lenses. You can see there's they're pretty close to you, um, and I can't ta- see anything. I'm dead. Remember, oh, that's right? Uh, and Taco, the uh, flaming, raging, poisoning sort of doom falls off your back and skitters a few feet. Uh, there's probably some other metallic stuff that that's I heartbreaking, missed. by the way, because it's of no use to me if it's not looking cool on my back. Yeah, but, that's the whole thing. It's um, like, next in the order, and then using my real ass voice, okay. I call Chance Lance to myself. Oh my god! Ooh, kid, are we gonna do a fucking 
Star Wars Episode Seven, like fuck yeah! All right, so I think you're both gonna do it. I think he's I, here's the thing. He's also going to try to call back the Chance Lance because he kind of has your voice also. Like we've had that in the fiction, so it's gonna be fucking. How does both he of- know that? There's no fucking way. Ah, uh, it's too good to not do it though, guys. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> um, make a make a char- charisma. I think that's what it is. I feel like charisma would remain the same no matter what body I'm in, but sure. <laughs> that's a 16 plus 1, 17. That's uh, an 11 minus garbage, because I don't think t- Magnus's body is very charismatic. All right. You both uh, reach your hands out, and uh, yours is the one that the Chance Lance flies into, and he looks over and actually smirks when he sees uh, how things have gone. Um, and it's his Who turn. Does? Who does? Edward does. Oh. It's his turn. What does he do? Hmm. Oh my god, I know what he does. <laughs> this is so I'm so delighted by all of these things I didn't even think about. For instance, um Magnus uh Edward is going to um make a, a strength check to try to rip off one of your fucking arms. Oh no. <gasps> oh, that's so poetic. Do you think that I'll ask you just to fair is fair? Do you think this would be a contest or do you think this would be just he checks to see if he can do it? Like, would you use your own strength to, like, I get, I think you would to fight him off from. Well, I know this, yeah. this fight has been all contest, but like, I kind of like the way it's going so far. Um, I feel good about my role, though. Oh, no. Okay. Whoa, off the table. Yeah, I rolled a three. Okay, yeah, he he rips off your right arm, and not, he says, "Not his flesh bod, right? His wood bod. His wood bod. Yeah, he rips okay, off your okay. mannequin arm." I had an image of like, <laughs> ripping off, off his arm. Ha! There, take now, that. Griffin, take that. How, how does that? If I don't have blood and veins and stuff, how does that affect damage to me? Well, I'm gonna just roll some dice, and I'm gonna tell you the number. Okay. I would say it wouldn't. That you get when you animate an object, it gets the stats. Yeah. Uh, that's twenty-one points of damage for unarmed. Um, yeah. Well, it's spe- it's a special unarmed because he ripped it. It's a, he didn't punch you. He tore your arm off. Um, Mag- I'll keep that in mind every other time I've ever done it, Griffin. Magnus. <sighs> uh huh. Got something for you. Yes. You just got your ass kicked, mm-hmm. and. When that happens, you feel a vision sort of wash over you, and suddenly you are miles away from this fight. Um, Me- meditating. Well, no, you're re- you're remembering, but this act of remembering is so like powerful that you are you are just like in another state, um, and so you just got your ass kicked, and you remember another time where you got your ass kicked. And it was a time where you saved a dog from some bullies that were kicking it around. Um, and you, you, you remember this, this memory really well. Um, it was one of the things that you saw when you, you spoke to the chalice in the last, um, in the last arc. Um, but there were parts of it then that you remember were kind of foggy. Parts of this memory that just seemed a little um, off. And you didn't realize it. Uh, w- w- what was off until this moment. Um, and, and in this particular vision, one thing that was kind of foggy was a big one. It was the sky. And as you look up in this memory, you're like lying on the ground. Um, and I think the uh, you've just like gotten beaten up by these kids, but you scared them off. Uh, and I think the dog comes and licks your face before it also kind of ungratefully takes off. Um, so you're laying on your back and you're looking up at the sky. And the sky is this unnatural light purple color and as you stop to think like wow that's weird you realize that there are two suns in the sky and they're they're nearly overlapping each other right on the horizon and you think oh that's that's weird but then you remember oh well no it's not weird at all because that's how it is um here in your home this this world in this that this memory is taking place in this is your home this world that you're on now this place you're at and have been for a while, it is not where you're from. It's Dagobah. <laughs> it's kind of Dagobah. Well, it would be uh, Tatooine, but it's not any of those wonderful uh, licensed oh, properties. Oh, shit! Um, 
and uh, just like that, you're back in the fight, uh, uh, just having had your arm ripped off. Uh, next up is Taco. So that was just like a fun memory. It didn't help me in this fight or nothing. Just a fun little, huh, that's weird. Anyways, back to where I'm getting my ass handed to me. Can you, Griffin, just so I, we, because I feel like a lot has been going on. Can you re-describe the, the scene? Um, there you have a fleet of mannequins and are they, are they, are the mannequins still going? Are the mannequins still attacking? Uh, yeah, I got them for an hour <laughs> or, or no, sorry. Um, for a minute. Okay, yeah, you still got him then. Um, so three mannequins are fighting Magnus, who's just had his metallic weapons and shield thrown from him. Uh, floating above him in the, uh, about 10 or 15 feet up is uh, Lydia, um, who is casting spells down from the sky. You have a uh, nearly dead Merle lying next to you. Oh, I'm and, dead. And you ha- you're you not dead. dead. And uh, you dead. have Magnus uh, standing in front of Edward with his arm torn off. I'm not dead yet. Oh, that's good. Now, Griffin, <laughs> can, can I assume that he took the arm that didn't have the chain? Like I was reaching. Yeah, for the you chain still, you still got the chain. He pulled the other one. Okay, cool. That's something, I guess. Yeah. Go ahead and uh, roll your d20s real quick for. Um, actually, uh, I, I just to streamline this because I don't know how long this fight's going to go, and I don't you have to roll like eighty dice uh, every turn. Um, I think just roll roll a d10, and we'll knock the number in half, and that'll be how many mannequins hit. You weren't talking to me, the dead guy, right? You're not I won't- dead, Clinton. You are unconscious. You are betwixt the state of Do you know how when you go to sleep and every dead. night, and you dream your dreamy dreams? You're not a dead man. You're just this sort of... This is an ex- Dwarf, okay. you're not he has passed no. beyond. Dad, hey, Dad, we have a three he, Monty Python joke limit before you're banned from the podcast. Oh, right. Okay, okay. I rolled ten out of ten. Oh, so all five hit. Okay. Uh, all right. Cool. Uh, go ahead and roll two d six then. Three and five. Eight. So fucking plus one. Plus Forty. Forty five damage. Yeah. Okay. Jesus. And they're loving it. <laughs> yeah, they're get, everybody's loving it. That goes without everybody's saying. Everybody's loving it. The other mannequins are like, finally, <laughs> it's our time to shine. Uh, all right, Edward is not looking so good. By which I mean Magnus is not looking so good. Kind of, I guess. I'm gonna cast. If we kill his body, mm. Mm. what uh-huh. happens to Magnus? Well, he won't die right away. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. Fine. Yeah. Man, this is about to become the Taco Show starring Taco eh? <laughs> Taco and his wooden buddy, no name. <laughs> Pinocchio. <laughs> Taco and his friend the, Pinocchio. The little wooden boy. <laughs> the, the ghost of their friend Merle. <laughs> These three jokesters. Um y- this isn't that cool. Um <clears throat> but I I want to I want to try to do what I think would be the most practical. Uh, and I'm going to cast uh, protection from evil and good on the uh, mannequin Merle, um, or mannequin Magnus, mannequin uh, Magnus. Okay, what does that do? Uh, one willing creature is protected against certain types of creatures, aberrations, celestial elementals, fey, fiends, and the undead. It grants several benefits. Creatures of those types have disadvantages on attack rolls against the target. Okay, the target can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by them. If the target is already charmed, frightened, or possessed by such a creature, the target has advantage on any new saving throw against the relevant effect. Okay, cool. Um, and and just in the interest of me, I didn't roll to see if I broke the enfeeble. Oh, yeah, go, go, go and roll d20. Yeah. Uh, roll the 15. Yeah, you're good. Merle, before you do your thing, I heard you just oh. roll. I just heard you roll your fucking. Did you roll the giantest dice? Yeah. dice? What the fuck was that? Yeah, that's the massive D twenty that they sent us. Merle, you um, see a small shape appear um, above you, uh, or rather, I guess you're just kind of you don't see right. Your eyes are probably closed because you're unconscious, but you um, you feel a presence, I guess. And uh, Taco and Magnus, you you do see uh, what appears uh, right above Merle. Um, and it's Cam's floating head and he still looks really scared. Um, uh, he doesn't have a wand. He is completely unarmed. Uh, but he says, uh, Hey, uh, Hey, Crimson Wonder, were you the one that cooked up that door earlier? I got an order for you. Can you make me up a healing game? And the red robe 
nods, and suddenly uh, Cam's pedestal from the healing game that you all played in in the last round uh, emerges from the floor in a column of black smoke. Uh, and uh, Cam looks down at Merle, and then he looks up at you, uh, Taco and Magnus, and he says, uh, I, uh, I thought of something heroic to do. And a mage hand appears in front of Cam and slaps down on the pedestal. Uh, and a just a beam of light shoots up from, from the ground beneath the pedestal, uh, consuming him and the pedestal, uh, which disappears in a puff of black smoke. Uh, and Merle, you are healed for six hit points. And you're back away. Hey, awesome. Cam! <laughs> Cam! In in, Mer- in Merle's defense, he didn't see any of that happen. Yeah, he sure. doesn't know what happened. <laughs> what um, the hell? Uh, Merle, you are awake and you are prone. All right. <laughs> I yeah. am... Prone is, is okay. I am going... Now, go with me on this. For once, let me do something in this okay. game. You fucking summon Della Reese all the time. What are you talking about for and once? Look, they bumped her off. It's not like it was Roma Downey. Okay, I'm going to use the Ring of the Grammarian. Yes. Oh, my to, God. To change divine word into divine wood. <laughs> <laughs> and you pop the most righteous boner. <laughs> and, this, and this imbues Marionette Magnus okay. with divine power. And heals him for twenty points. And heals it for. T- oh. How about roll, roll, uh, roll a roll, roll a d twenty, and that's how many you heal plus wisdom. Okay, I'll give you the rest of the shit, and we'll figure out what divine power is in a second. I rolled an eleven plus three wisdom, so that's fourteen. So All right, it gives him fourteen points, and he is divine. All right, and we'll figure that out in a second. Um, we'll get to that real soon. Actually, Lydia is up next. Um, and she is going to cast Death Bolt at Taco. And that is a 17 versus AC Taco. Yup. It's going to be a bad hit. Uh, That is 19 points of damage, Taco. Been a good run. (laughs) Are you at zero? Taco. I'm at negative five. Oh, my God. Okay. Taco goes down. Adios. Taco goes down, but this time his soul didn't fire out of his body to go on a rescue mission. It's still in there, and it is asleep. Uh, Magnus, you are up. Okay. So I'm holding Chance Lance, mm-hmm. a weapon given to me by a goddess. Yes. And I am imbued with divinity. Yes. I'm going to channel that divinity into the chance lance and stab Magnus in the back. Okay. All right, yeah, make an attack roll. Off the table. It's a 15 plus 9, 24. It wouldn't be plus 9 because that factors in your human fighter strength, um, but it's... a. It, uh... Plus your, yeah, plus, I think it's plus five because it's plus three with your strength and then. Uh, yeah, with so the 20. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that hits. Um, roll 3d10 damage. Okay. 10, 2, 4. So 16 plus five, I think, for the weapon, right? Mm hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. You rear back the chance lance and jab it forward and before it even makes contact uh a a faint light uh emits out of the front of it like you're sh- you're shooting a beam of very faint but it's it's there uh holy light out of the end of the chance lance and that's what hits edward um and Edward flies forward, and because you were behind him, Magnus, he kind of lands almost perfectly in between all of you. Um, and uh, you hear him say, he kind of gets up on all fours, and he says, uh, Huh, 
and then he falls over and almost like a, a like a a cartoon dead person you see edward's spectral lich form rise up out of magnus's body and he says did you really think and before he finishes his thought taco your umbrella has turned inside out and it's pointing in edward's direction because whenever you defeat a magical enemy um the Umbra staff consumes the magic essence of, of that magic user. And unfortunately for Edward, he's all magical energy. <laughs> Only Taco could do away with an enemy while he was unconscious. I just killed somebody while I'm dead. What's yeah, up? So your fucking, Taco rules. Your fucking Umbra staff like rears up in your, uh, in your sleepy, sleepy hand and eats Edward whole. Um, and like full blown fucking Ghostbusters style. Um, and, uh, Edward is pulled into the mouth of the Umbra staff and disappears into it. Um, but he doesn't go down quite as smooth as the wands and staves that the, the umbrella has consumed in the past. A lot of body, a lot of body to that one, huh? Bitter, uh, well, it, it, some tannins. It, it, <laughs> it's very hoppy. It's an IPA. Hoppy it feels actually like, um, he's getting tossed around inside of there. Like he's banging against the walls of the Umbra staff. Uh, and it actually goes flying out of your unconscious hand at like really, really quickly. Uh, and it's just kind of like bouncing around the floor as he is just getting like tossed around inside of it. And after about, uh, 10 seconds or so, uh, the Umbra staff turns inside out again and shoots him out. And he slides about eight feet down the runway and then disintegrates into ash. And nice. Lit- Lydia screams when this mm-hmm. happens, and she drops down beside her fallen brother. And, like, immediately you can tell, like, something is is wrong with her um, because, like, she's losing shape. She's losing, like, the clarity of her lit shape, and these bolts of crackling black electricity are, like, encircling her as she's losing her form. Um, and she's right now she's just back in her basic black robe form like no fancy garments whatsoever and she's coming apart kind of like you saw the red robe fall apart once before back in in the 11th hour arc um only this time she is not pulling herself back up together um and she she picks up some of the ash in her hands and she says uh i guess i guess we still needed each other after all and then she points a finger towards all of you and she says I don't actually think she says anything. I think she just just screams and there is a flash of 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 darkness and there's this deafening roar and you feel this like dark crackling energy blowing around all of you like a sandstorm. Um and when it passes, she's gone. And sitting in a a, a pile of ashes, another pile of ashes at the end of the runway, you see a small copper bell inlaid with a diamond pattern across its body where she laid. And you hear the red robe say, oh, my God. And he points down at the ground on the runway. And Magnus, all your belongings, your, uh, well, the belongings that you didn't knock away are piled up on the ground where Edward fell. But your body is gone. My beautiful body. With her last furious act, Lydia destroyed your body. Hey everybody, welcome to, welcome to, welcome to the middle of the episode. I'm Griffin McElroy, your Dungeon Master, your best friend, and your clock. I couldn't think of anything, but on my desk right in front of me, there's a very small clock, and so I just said that. Um, Thanks, though, for listening to episode 57 of The Adventure Zone. It's uh, one of the later episodes in the Suffering Game arc, which is drawing to a close, and... um, uh, boy, things are just about to pop off. I'm very excited for you to hear the rest of the episode, but I'm more excited for you to hear about our great, great sponsors that we have this week. Uh, our first one is Blue Apron. Uh, you've heard us talk about it on so many of our other shows, and it's not just hot air, folks. I'm a big Blue Apron fan. Uh, we uh, cooked a really nice Blue Apron last night that was like this lamb and beef stew. Anyway, I'm just telling you food words right now i should say what the thing is you get sent a box uh for ten dollars per person per meal and the box is going to have pre-portioned ingredients and a recipe tells you how to turn those ingredient ingredients i've recorded so much stuff today and it's just the words that my brain just can't do it no more um 
It tells you how to turn the ingredients into delicious home-cooked meals. And you can choose from new recipes each week. Stuff like uh, cashew chicken stir-fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice, roasted pork with apple, walnut, and farro salad, crispy barramundi with uh, quinoa and roasted carrot salad. So much great stuff. You can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash adventure. And uh, you're just going to love it because I, I love it. It's taught me how to cook. It's changed my life. It's so good. One more time, that's blueapron.com slash adventure. Um, I also want to tell you about movement watches. That's M V M T. Uh, watches and uh, these are watches that are really just very fashionable very high fashion high quality minimalist products uh, at revolutionary prices I've had one for um, a few months now I got one late last year and I really like it I'm not like an accessory dude at all other than my glasses um, and my Merkin and I just love this this watch and the way that it looks on my arm it's like one of the very few things that I own that I wear my body that I've actually gotten compliments for. Um, you, uh, the, these watches start at just ninety five bucks uh, at a department store. Watches like this, you're looking at like four hundred, five hundred bucks. Um, but by selling online, they can cut out the middleman and retail markup and provide you with the best possible price. You can get fifteen percent off that price today with free shipping and free returns by going to movementwatches.com/adventure. Again, that is m v m t watches.com/adventure. Um, and, uh, it's just do it. Go step up your watch game. You're going to like it. Um, have a personal message here, uh, for this Jumbotron and it's for Angus McDonald, boy detective. And it's from our first Jumbotron guest DM, Chris Callison Birch, who says, you are in the bargain aisle of fantasy Costco. A sign reads incomplete set. Now only 10,000 gold. You see a familiar glint. You pull a fork from your pocket to compare. This is your grandfather's silverware. Your emotions swirl, joy, confusion, realization, betrayal. You smell brimstone and turn to see Garfield the Deals Warlock. What do you do? And I guess, am I supposed to, hmm, I think the better thing for me to do instead of playing this as as Angus is just sort of pitch this to the audience and then I don't know how you're going to continue this correspondence with um with the entire listenership of the Adventure Zone but you'll figure something out. Um Man, but what would Angus do? Shit, I don't know. You're putting me on the spot here. Um, thank you for this this wonderful conundrum, though. I feel like it's fleshed out Angus as a character. Uh, and uh, I have a commercial message here. It's for Necronomic Cards, which is a horror card game now available at Necron- necronomicards.com. Uh, and they say, Is your idea of a good time matching together arcane magic symbols to summon horrific monsters and ancient Lovecraftian deities? You're in luck. Necronomic Cards is a fast-paced, cutthroat indie card game of pattern recognition and backstabbing for two to four players beautifully illustrated and extremely fun and easy to learn it is the perfect game for any fan of horror or mythology buy it now at www.necronomicards.com and keep an eye out for necronomic cards volume 2 coming to kickstarter in march 2017 that's next month uh we got sent this game uh thank you very much necronomic cards it is uh it's 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 really cool and too spooky to be forgotten I want to thank everybody who's been tweeting about the show using the the Zonecast hashtag. Uh, if you do that, you might end up as a character on the show. Um, there are I, I have ideas for how I can inject a few more characters into the remainder of this campaign. And every time I mention the end of this campaign, I do always have to also mention that the podcast is not coming to an end. No, of course not. We like doing the podcast way too much. We're just going to figure out something different and very, very exciting to do. Uh, but we have time to figure that out as we move into sort of the end game here for this campaign. Um, but we really appreciate you spreading the word. We don't pay to advertise the show at all. And so um, any any growth that we've had can be attributed only and explicitly to you, the listeners, telling your friends uh, who you think might, might like it. So uh, thank you all very, very much for helping to make this show what it is. Uh, hey, here's something exciting that uh, I haven't talked about yet. We uh, are going to be doing a new live show for the Adventure Zone. Uh, and we're uh, the, my favorite part is that we're doing it here in Austin at the beautiful Paramount Theater. It's my favorite venue. I cannot believe I'm doing a show there. I've seen so many shows there, and it is completely wild to me that I get to do something there. Um, again, thank you very much for making this show what it is and letting us do shows at the Paramount. Uh, so it's going to be uh, at, uh, at the Paramount in Austin, Saturday, May 20th. Uh, at 8 p.m. I don't know. I don't think you need to know the time quite yet, but uh, yeah, we're gonna be doing Adventure Zone, and uh, I, I, I 
don't know quite what we're going to be doing, but those live shows uh, have historically always been a whole lot of fun. And so I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing you all out there, some cosplay, getting together with some good friends and just having a good time. Uh, again, we're going to be doing a show, Austin, the Paramount, Saturday, May 20th. Uh, you can get tickets at bit.ly forward slash Taz Austin 2017. I also think bit.ly uh, slash Austin Taz 2017 will get you there. Uh, but that is the ticket link. We're also doing a show, uh, a Mabim Bam, the following day at the Paramount. You can find tickets for that at Mabim Bam, uh, bit.ly forward slash Mabim Bam Austin 2017. Um, so, yeah, if you live in Austin or anywhere in Texas or you just want to come hang out, uh, go grab those tickets. They go on sale this Friday. That is tomorrow. This Friday. February 24th at 10 a.m. Central Time. If you live on the East Coast, that's 11 a.m. Uh, if you live on the West Coast, that is 8 a.m. So I think, God, I hope I got all those right. It's 10 a.m. Central Time uh, the, this coming Friday. So grab those tickets because uh, they they will probably go pretty fast. Uh, that is it for this commercial break. Uh, thank you all so much. Oh, I guess I should mention the TV show that also launches today. Uh, if you're a fan of this podcast and you've listened to My Brother, My Brother and Me, we did a TV show for My Brother, My Brother and Me uh, for CISO. And all six episodes of that TV show are live right now. God, what a bonkers day this is. Uh, they're all live right now at CISO.com or you can grab them on the CISO app. Uh, which is on a bunch of different set-top boxes. I've got it on Apple TV. Uh, CISO is amazing. They let us do a TV show. They have a bunch of other really great original programming. And uh, again, the Mabim Bam show is up there now. So go check it out. We're really proud of it. And um, I, I hope you really enjoy it. That is it. Okay, back to the rest of this episode. It's about to get, y'all, it's about to get wet and wild. I have like, things are about to happen in this episode that I've been like looking forward to for like a year. And so I'm so excited uh, for it to start popping off. And I just hope you, like, this is a weird thing for, like, somebody who's telling a story to, like, ask of its audience. But um, I just, I just, I hope you trust me because uh, I've, I've got a plan. It might be a bad plan, but um, anyway, here's the rest of the episode. Next episode is going to go up on February. Nope, that's not true. March 2nd. So uh, we'll talk to you then. And until then... Keep it, keep, uh, just keep, keep, stay frosty. Bye. Um, all of you are still on the catwalk. Um, the bell is right in front of you and you feel it sort of calling all of you um merle you're up but taco is down which um you may need to rectify do we think my, our healing powers are back um you, I, could, you could give it a shot i have a spell called raise dead i mean he's, he's not a, dead he's not dead not dead I'm not dead i'm only mostly dead oh my <laughs> god my python princess bride this show's got it all <laughs> to blaze <laughs> uh, Blave. Uh, <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so the, did we beat the liches? Yeah. But na 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 na. Ta -da. Taco is dead, but somehow there's an amazing spectral something, <laughs> and he raises up just enough, like just the energy of eating Edward gave him enough strength to say three words and griffin does that sound right just tonight? have like, yeah, somebody heal you before you do this fucking yeah, like you are just revived by your I cool i can't phrase. say hard ass shit 20 minutes after we kill someone okay fine. and with the fucking marx brothers here it could be upwards of 30 <laughs> <laughs> all right go ahead go. marx brothers reference yay it does it's not don't, a reference don't laugh so it. hard you're zeppo what <laughs> taco what do you say what do you what did you what do you astrally project in the atmosphere <laughs> Liches get stitches. Okay. <laughs> now, now, to be out. fair, Merle, I think we would both agree that Taco would want to die after making that joke. So we should just let him go peacefully into that I, good night. <laughs> the first thing I do before yes. we do anything else is I heal check Taco. Through, I check heal through my belongings. Taco. <laughs> I check through my belongings to make sure Steve and the goldfish is okay.
He's fine. Yeah, you got him. He's just, oh. he's, he's blubbing around. Uh, and you recover, everybody recovers the belongings that were knocked away by the magnets. Except um, presumably me, because I'm unconscious. Yeah. Also in Also in my possessions are healing potions that I bought and never used. I give Taco a fucking healing potion. Okay. It 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 heals him some hit points. Thank you, pal. The number doesn't matter. And yeah, oh, he thank, gets... He, thank, thank God. Uh, I had... Uh, a dream that I said the the coolest shit ever. <laughs> I actually <laughs> said that. It, 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 weird, but I was the one who said it. Okay, if the, I remember oh, correctly. The yeah. So the healing is the healing worked. You are healed, um, and uh, you are you are back awake. Although you are still very bad off, and now you just have the uh, the bell laying in a pile of ashes, and the red robe is is kind of pointing towards it. <sighs> Should okay. I get it? Um, I'm talking to the want- red robe. Like, should I grab the bell? Yeah, he should. Sh- should I get it? He shrugs. Aren't you still a mannequin? Yeah. I. You probably uh, be safest to pick it up. Yeah, mm-hmm. I pick it. I pick it up. Okay. Um, you hear a voice in your head as you pick it up with your one uh, remaining arm, uh, and this bell says, um, "How would you like to live forever?" I'd hate it. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> okay, you know, you got other stuff, but let's just roll a wisdom saving throw. I was an eighteen plus whatever my. Uh, it's not good for your body mannequin is. body, but uh, the eighteen is sufficient. You, well, you, you know, up- all he needs is a coat of varnish, and he is gonna basically live forever. <laughs> That's not a bad point. Uh, he, uh, uh, you hear the bell say, uh, "Oh, okay," <laughs> as you shut it down, uh, and uh, you have reclaimed. The sixth grand relic, the Animus Bell. Uh, Just to make that clear, I've been thinking about this a lot since Magnus almost died, and like his great reward is looking forward to being with his wife. Yeah, after, sure. Like living a go. So like the idea of living forever is like the least interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Thing to that Magnus that all totally tracks. Um, as soon as you pick up the bell, you and also you did die. I yeah, mean, can we I point don't out get technical? You about are it, but you you are dead. Yeah, your body got destroyed, so you're dead. You're dead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um. As soon as you grab the bell, you feel a fe- all of you feel this fierce wind blow through this big chamber that you're in, uh, and it it knocks over the mannequins in the audience. Taco, it knocks over your friend mannequins. Uh, these mannequins also were kneeling by you as you were unconscious, like checking on you, making sure that you were all right, all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, and the, this big, this this strong wind knocks over a light hanging from the ceiling, and you see some black uh, smog get caught up in the windstorm, and it's just whipping off the walls and off the floor that you're standing on. Um, it's sort of uh, uh, pulling, it's absorbing the cylinders all around the room, which are all turning into black smog, and this, this smog in the wind is now just so thick that you can't see anything. You're just surrounded by this deafening black windstorm. Um, and then the wind shifts directions. It, it's, it just starts going straight upward, and the smog is lifted, and Wonderland is just gone. You're all standing back in the middle of that circular clearing in the Felicity Wilds, and those billboards that were lining the path into the, into the center uh, here, they're just gone. Um, and it's just the three of you and the red robe and about 20 other folks who are all uh, standing in this clearing. And everybody looks understandably pretty confused. A lot of folks look understandably pretty miserable. Um, and Taco, yeah. you, f- you feel a hand on your shoulder and you're healed for 36 hit points. Nice. And standing behind you is Antonia. Your your elf friend, one of the three uh, folks that you met in the woods uh, on the way in, and she has a a sash tied around her eyes, and her hair is now streaked with white. And she says, um, "I don't remember these voices. I apologize." But she says, uh, "Rough day." Yeah, yeah. It's been a hard one. I died twice, I guess. So I'm and um. That's been all the things that have happened. <laughs> I didn't push. It. How was your thing? Yeah, and to help you out, Griffin, she talked like Eva Gabor. Okay, I don't think that's true, nor could I replicate that. Um, she says, uh, my day was pretty shit. Mm. Uh, are, are you a mannequin? Uh, no. Ma- oh, my God, is that madness? Yeah, yeah so maybe, like, <laughs> keep your shit to yourself unless you're a fucking mannequin. And I storm over to the red robe. Answers now. 
Um, hey, I do have a question. Amongst yeah. the retrieving our belongings, did Magnus did get himself an arm, right? He got his arm back. Yeah, uh, plugged it back in like a G.I. Joe. I think Magnus I think Magnus has his arm, but it's not attached. I think that would take okay. some time to fix. I hit the red robe with it. Um, <laughs> uh, he he catches the arm as you swing it at him. Uh, let's finish this first. We'll get to that. Um, uh, you, uh, and Antonia says, um, well, you... I take all that, that I, I take it that this was all your your guys doing saving all these people getting us all out. Uh, you mean destroying the entire building and yeah, wiping that, out a bunch of yeah that, that was, was us. us sounds like yeah. us. She says I no matter what you did in there I think this is all that matters really. You you saved all these people they wanted us to believe that we are who we are when we're at our worst but you know that's not true don't don't you Taco <laughs> yeah I guess I. would Really didn't save the day. At the end of the day. At the end of the day, I guess it doesn't matter who pushed what buttons <laughs> and who betrayed who, really. The important thing is that we're all family. <laughs> we're all part of this thing called life. Um, you, uh, as well, uh, by the way, you're welcome. Hakuna Matata. As you're saying that, you. Sterling approaches you, Merle, and... He it looks uh, like he looked when you saw him in that screen. He's in like his late thirties with this early silver hair, and he looks gaunt. Um, and for like he's he's silent for just a moment, and then he drops to a knee in in reverence, and he he says, um, "Merle, I I made a terrible mistake. Maybe he sounds cool now, actually. Merle, <laughs> I made a terrible mistake in that place, and it's what I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my days." I was the one who chose to forsake you in the first round. I, I knew I was sending you all to certain doom, and I, I didn't care. And, well, that's not very lordly of me, was it? My son. What? My son. My son. Say three Hail Marys and six push-ups, and all is forgiven. <laughs> he says, um... I'm I'm so sorry for you for for what I did to you Merle in in there and I vow to you that someday I will use my considerable power to to make it up to you. Oh, I, I didn't know you had considerable power. Yeah, I'm the Lord of Neverwinter. I'm the most powerful man in the world. I don't like to brag, but And you were a giant douche before. That's awesome. Hey, hey Griffin, can yeah. we deal with the full metal alchemist situation I find myself in now, please? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, your buddy Rowan is there too. Um, and, and my jerky uh, buddy, it's great. I'm so happy to see him. Uh, okay. He, you used to have to eat food. Do you yeah. remember that? I used to be able to enjoy food. Yes, I do remember that. Yes. Now you live on sap. Um, he actually started to approach you, Magnus, and then when he heard you like having a fit and being all angry, having a fit, Griffin, I, th I think I yeah. lost my damn body. I think I think he's uh, <laughs> oh, just having a real hissy. Getting I think he's staying away from hissy. <laughs> um. You didn't just lose an arm. Magnus, before you have your conversation, you approach and you swing the club at the at the red robe. Um, uh, you, you swing your uh, your other arm at the red robe. Um, and right as he like kind of catches it and keeps it from hitting him, you have another vision. It's another memory that you are remembering so like powerfully and vividly that you just aren't here anymore. Um, and this one's not like the other one where it was just like kind of fuzzy and it cleared up. This one is just static until it isn't. And you are walking through some some badlands. It's this arid landscape of cracked red rock and clay as far as the eye can see with a few shrubs poking through. And you are lost. You are so lost in this um, unforgiving environment. And you you came here to hide something, you like that part is still a little bit foggy. You're, you've you've made something, and you're terrified of it, and so you came to this place to hide it. But you got lost, and now you're so thirsty. Um, you've you've removed the jacket of your uniform, which you've kind of sweat through. It is a a bright crimson red uniform with an insignia patch over the left breast pocket. You've taken that off because it's just too hot to have a jacket on right now um and you're just stumbling through this through this badlands and you see a stranger um you actually see two strangers in the distance a man and a small girl and they approach you and they offer you a drink 
and they offer you kindness and hospitality and they're really good people. You spend some time with them and they're just really good. And so you decide that you're going to hide your creation with them because they're going to be the ones who are going to be able to keep this cup safe. And it takes you a while to come to and you're just sort of in this like fugue state because you've been quietly walking with the rest of the group. You're all walking uh, with the red robe uh, back through the Felicity Wilds uh, following him. Um, and, uh, he, he stops you all in, in the wilds and, um, uh, he says, um, he says, uh, I don't blame you for not trusting me right now, but I promise I, everything's going to make sense real soon. I literally have nothing to lose. So like, sure. You all hear, uh, a crackle of like, uh, uh, uh of what sounds like static and the red robe goes quiet. And he really quickly puts a finger up to his hood, and uh, he he extends uh, uh, a finger, and an illusory object appears, and it is in the shape of your stone of far speech. And he holds out a palm. Uh, uh, he is he is requesting your stones of far speech, um, and you can hear um, the voice of Angus on the stone of far speech. And he's saying, "Sirs, sirs, are you there? You've been out of sirs." You've you've been offline for a while. Are you there? Um, and the red robe is is requesting your stones of far speech. And even though you can't see his face, he seems like urgent. I give it to him. I look at Taco and I look at Merle and I say, uh, "Do it." Uh, I want a receipt. I want a receipt. All right, here's mine. I didn't want to talk to the kid anyway. Taco. Yeah. Okay. You all hand over your stones of far speech. And he crushes them in his hand. Oh, um, and hell yeah, going and, rogue. And been waiting for this the whole time. <laughs> Fuck yes, uh, off and, the grid. I and, pull out my credit cards and shred them. <laughs> Fuck yes. <laughs> I moved um, to Portland. Taco's and, always ready for this. I'm ready to go off the grid at any fucking moment. Um, and uh, Angus's tiny voice is. Uh, is drowned out as these stones are shattered. And right as he shatters them, um, something like thunder roars overhead. Um, and only then do you notice that the sky above is, it looks like it's storming, but it's not raining. Like it looks like it's storming in terms of like the look of it, but it's not, it's not actually, there's no precipitation. Um, and uh, the red robe says, uh, that was close. I've, I, I forgot about that. About your, your stones. Listen, there's not much time. Night's going to fall soon, and we need to make some headway before it does, because, well, tomorrow's going to be fateful. Um, and he, he looks at you, Magnus, and he says, oh, I forgot something else. Um, and he conjures up um, another uh, uh, object. This one's not illusory, though. It's a, it, it's a small coin-shaped object that appears in his hand. And you hear him whisper into it, and he says... Um, You'll need to disguise Magnus, obviously, and don't let anyone touch him or we'll be discovered. And then he waves his hand over the coin and it disappears. Wait, am, am I now, like, am I covered? Am I disguised? No, no. He just, he just like, took a note or something into this coin and then it disappeared. Okay. Uh, make, it, make a survival check, which is fun, because I don't think we've ever done this one. I mean, not great. Five. Nineteen. Hell yeah, Bear Grylls. Uh, 15. <laughs> um, Merle, with your survival check, you are sort of leading um, the party through the Felicity Wilds. Um, you are making your way towards sort of the, the main road to the east. Um, and I'm eating rotten rabbits that I find along the Jesus, road. God, Jesus, what? Yeah, no. listen, life's tough. Um, you... We've been walking for two hours, Merle. <laughs> there was no need to resort to that. You... I have appetites. You with dark, your... Dark, appetites. <laughs> <laughs> with your uh, really good role, you, uh, when it comes time to make camp, you stumble across a clearing, and it has a really well-crafted fire pit in the middle, um, and there are three stumps carved into surprisingly comfortable-looking chairs, and you know this place because this is a campsite that the three of you made a little over a year ago on one of your first nights together. And you realize that you're really close now to the road that connects Neverwinter and, well, the ruins of Phandalin. 
and you're close to the Gerblin hideout and, and Wave Echo Cave. You're you're close to all that stuff, and you make camp quickly in your familiar campsite, and uh, all of you get a, well, a good, a hard-earned good night's rest. Um, and Magnus, you dream some wild shit. Um, too many things actually to remember all of the next morning, but there are two visions that stick out, and they are just as like powerful as the ones that you've experienced so far. And the first is you're standing on the deck of a silver ship, and there are some other red robe figures standing around you, although you can't quite make out their faces. And this ship is soaring into the sky, and it's flying away from. A, a, a land that is being consumed by this wave of darkness with these ribbons of bright green and red and blue inside. It's just being swallowed up. And the other vision that you can recall is really simple. It's the void fish. Floating up into its tank is a thick book bound in blue leather and silver trim. And that's... Is it the Noid fish? It's the Void Fish's brother, the Domino's Pizza ruining Noid Fish. <laughs> and you all, the next morning, the next morning, you all make your way through the woods, past the main and road. I, I don't recognize the book at all. I just know, like, hey, no. look. Yeah. I have a question. I know you're on a roll, and I don't mean to interrupt, but these visions he's having, are they from his point of view? He doesn't see his they own. They are first person, yes. He is not seeing his own face in this vision. Yes, and also he is, he. you don't know, Merle doesn't know about them. These are just Magnus visions. Well, this was your dad asking. No, yes, 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 I know. Um, Who? I'm just so wrapped up in the fiction. It's uh, me, Larry Burnside. I forgot we even had a dad, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just so <laughs> deep in this story. Y'all, I'm now. sorry, my heart's racing because this next shit is like shit I've been wanting to get to go, for a year. Go, Dang go, it. go, go! The next morning you wake up and you you finish your journey through the Felicity Wilds. You go past the main road. You're actually not far now from where you found those 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 dead horses where um where Barry Blue Jeans and uh, Gundren were attacked. Um and you go past that road and you go through more woods and um you you follow the red robe now um as he leads you towards your destination and he leads you to the mouth of a well hidden cavern carved into actually the very same stretch of foothills where you found that Gerblin compound where Clark was. Um, it's a few dozen miles from, from that cavern, but it's the same, the same foothills, uh, and there are some, some similarities. The red robe leads you into this cavern and through a winding, narrow path uh, deeper into the cool depths of the foothills. And after a few minutes of spelunking, you find yourself in a room cleft into the stone. And it's obviously the layer of something that is been cleared out by this red robe which is its current occupant this room is lit by several dozen candles all arranged on a desk piled with magical tomes and maps and behind that desk is a large wooden board displaying the whole of Faerun, with strings connecting images and diagrams at certain points on the map uh in in towns like fandolin and armos and greenhold and rockport and goldcliff and neverwinter and it's the board of somebody who has been tracking the relics and the bureau intently. And there's another source of light in this room. There is a six foot tall glowing pod uh, on the opposite end of this room from the desk. And it's full of a swirling green fluid. And inside we can see something growing or rather someone. There is a body being created inside of this pod, but the liquid is too opaque for you to see who it is. Um, and on the desk, there is a scroll unfurled and held in place by several candles, and it is an incredibly detailed map with a route drawn through it in red, and it's a map depicting with perfect accuracy the headquarters of the Bureau of Balance. And there's another thing in this room that catches your eye, a small, plain, wooden chest, and draped over that chest is a red robe. Like an, like an actual tangible red robe, not the personification that you've been talking to. And sewn into, into its breast, you see a familiar sight. You see a circular patch with a design containing 12 multicolored circles and a sort of like shifting, imparsable text in the middle of it. Only Magnus, you can read that text as plain as day. It's an acronym and it says I-P-R-E. And the red robe speaks and says... Events that have uh, been in motion for over a decade are about to reach critical mass. 
there are gaps in your stories that are unimaginably massive. But before the end of this day, I promise you they will be filled. Uh, and he drifts over to the tank and says, uh, I, I acquired this invention years ago, and I've used it to recreate my physical form several times now in pursuit of my goal. I, I, I've come close, but I've, I've never reached that goal. It's because once I'm in my body, I'm going to forget all of the truths that I know now in my lich form. And I can try and convince myself to follow my own commands. And he shows you that, that coin-shaped object that you saw him speaking into earlier. And he says, but, well, I can be pretty stubborn. And I also don't have any of my potent magical abilities inside of my body because I'm not going to remember the fact that I'm a lich at all. He looks at you, Magnus, and he says, Magnus, I see your wheels spinning, but I'm, I'm sorry. It takes months for this device to grow a new body, and we don't have months, fellas. We have hours. He says, I'm going to... I'm going to go into that tank and into my body and then the four of us are going to head back to the Bureau of Balance and we're going to get the truth that we deserve. And it's going to be uncomfortable here in a bit, perhaps, because you're going to recognize me, but I'm not going to recognize you. So I apologize in advance for my rudeness. And he drifts towards the tank and he says, if we all follow my commands, we will be successful I have been planning this for some time, and I believe wholeheartedly in my preparations. And he sinks into the tank, and you see one last time the cowl of the red robe poke out of the tank, and he says, Hey, Merle, would you be a bud? I'm, uh, I'm going to be naked as a jaybird when I come out of here. Can you fetch me a change of clothes from that chest? Be glad to, buddy. Um, and he lowers down into the tank. And at this time, Magnus... You're struck with one more vision, and this one's a doozy. You have your back up to a cliff's edge, axe drawn, an army of shadows approaching, and the sky is pitch black, so, so black that the sky can't contain it all. It looks like there are columns of tar illuminated with streaks of red and green and blue just falling, just dripping out of the sky, and plowing into the ground. And in the distance, you see a silver ship weave between those columns and fly out of sight. And when you see it fly away, you feel this sense of immense relief. And next to you, you see a human man. And he is wearing the same crimson uniform that you've got on with the same patch, only instead of a jacket, he's wearing a full robe. And he looks at you as this horde is about to overrun you, and he drops the wand that he's holding and a, a black spike shoots out from out of the horde and into his chest and he staggers, but he stays on his feet. And he turns and he looks at you, Magnus, and he smiles and he says, well, we'll get him next time. And Merle, you crack open the chest and retrieve the clothes within. A white cotton shirt, a studded leather belt, and a pair of pants sturdy denim and blue the membrane encasing this pod splits and green brackish fluid splashes out and onto the floor and a stout naked human man steps out of the pod and you recognize his face instantly it's the face of a man who you quite reasonably assumed you would never see again because the last time you saw this face it was being swallowed up in the righteous fire that destroyed the town of Phandalin. But here he is. Barry's back. Maximumfun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported. I'm Biz. And I'm Teresa. And we host the weekly comedy podcast, One Bad Mother. We celebrate our moments of parenting genius. As well as our failures. Just like, we're yeah. going to have hot dogs. And I'm yeah. like, oh, no, we're having fun. Everybody loves hot dogs. Yeah. And it just like smashes that thing right on my chest. And then I'm just uh, crying in the middle of like kid space yeah. while people are like literally dancing with their children. Parenting can be sad and painfully funny at the same time. So join us each week as we admit that this is hard, but we're getting really good at it. Find us at Max MaximumFun.org or wherever you download podcasts. Hello, and welcome to Podphone. What type of podcast are you looking for? You have chosen... 
funny podcasts about bad movies. Rated R. May we recommend The Flop House. Three friends talk about bad movies and make each other and you laugh. Rated R. The Flop House is playing at your ears. If you download it right now or whenever. Rated R. To purchase tickets to The Flop House. You don't need to do that. Just download it. The Flop House, rated R for nudity, I guess.